Ryan Newman's crash. Daytona's worst NASCAR crash in 19 years. Ryan Newman off turn four for the final time. Blaney to the outside, oh. to the inside. Here comes Hamlin up the outside. Wow. Crash. Hey everybody, Dr. Chris, orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine physician. Welcome to my channel, your number one stop for information on orthopedics and sports injuries that's easy to understand for everyone. Okay. If you want to know more about my life as an orthopedic surgeon, be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Stable Knees. I'm also on TikTok at Dr. Chris Rayner. If you're looking for information on workouts and exercises or tips on injury prevention, don't forget to check us on our sister channel, Human 2.0. I'm on a mission to teach everyone about orthopedics and sports medicine. Help me accomplish this goal by sharing this video with anyone who you think might be interested in this topic. Ryan Newman aka the rocket man is a u.s professional stock car race driver he currently drives the number six mustang for roush fenway racing in the nascar cup series recently on february 17th of 2020 newman was involved in a serious crash during the 2020 daytona 500 race the race was exciting and included many lead changes and several major collisions that decreased the feel of cars by almost half including a wreck only six laps from the end of the race and another on the final lap just prior to Newman's crash. During overtime, on the final lap of the race, while Newman was in the lead, Newman was bumped from behind by Ryan Blaney in the number 12 Mustang. Unfortunately, Newman's car was turned hard right into the outside wall. The car immediately flipped upside down and landed on its roof. It slid down the track on its roof in traffic before it was struck at speed by Corey Lejoie in the number 32 Mustang. It was the most violent wreck at Daytona since the tragic accident that involved Dale Earnhardt in 2001. Newman's car was struck on the driver's side while upside down and launched 10 to 12 feet in the air before landing on its roof and continuing to slide another several hundred feet down the track. The car ignited on leaking fuel before stopping and coming to a rest while a flame having crossed the finish line in the fourth position. Yes, he finished the race on his roof while on fire. The fire was quickly doused by the safety crew, who then went to work on extricating Newman, who did not appear to be alert or responsive. Emergency crews righted the vehicle with a tow truck before removing the vehicle's roof and extricating Newman from the vehicle. The removal was not broadcast by NASCAR, and the emergency crew obscured the extrication with black screens to prevent fans from seeing anything while they worked. NASCAR officials directed media personnel to leave the track, and also directed them to not broadcast any of the emergency proceedings. Given the violence of the impact, it appeared as though the very worst outcome had occurred as a result of this collision. At the very least, Newman appeared to be unresponsive when extricated from the vehicle. After extrication, Newman was taken directly from the track by ambulance to the Halifax Medical Center. Newman's condition was not disclosed for several hours until finally it was announced that he was undergoing surgery and was suffering from serious but not life-threatening injuries. The following day, the media reported that Newman was awake, communicating with his family members and in good spirits. The day after that, he was discharged from the hospital, walking out under his own power, hand in hand with his daughters. So this leads us to the first question. What injuries did he suffer? At this point, Newman's injuries have not been disclosed. However, we can deduce a few things from his walk out of the hospital. He did not have any dressings on his head, neck, face, or exposed arms. This precludes skull or facial fractures, fractures of the spine, and fractures of the upper extremities. Also, his ability to walk out likely also precludes fractures of his lower extremities or pelvis. Although he may have suffered soft tissue injuries of the lower extremities, skeletal injuries are unlikely. This leaves injuries of the chest and or abdomen as the remaining possibilities for which he may have received surgery. Possible injuries that might require surgery immediately after injury could include a severe unstable clavicle fracture with tenting 
or an open segment, a splenic rupture, or an intra-abdominal perforation. Regardless of the injury, it is surprising to see him discharged after only 48 hours and walking out of the hospital under his own volition and power. It is amazing that he does not appear to have suffered any significant extremity or skeletal fractures. In particular, given the energy and the point of impact, we might expect Ryan to have suffered fractures of his left humerus and arm, left leg, and pelvis. In addition, we might also expect fractures of his spine, especially his cervical spine. This leads us to our next question. How did he survive? If we calculate the force of impact, assuming a vehicle speed of 190 miles per hour, or 85.38 meters per second, and a weight for Ryan of 198 pounds, or 90 kilograms, then a collision could be expected to generate an impact force of 1,640 kilonewtons, which would be like getting hit with a mass of 368,604 pounds. Um, that's a hell of a lot of weight and can easily result in a serious injury or even death. So how did Ryan avoid death in this horrific crash? And how do you avoid being crushed by the force of impact? Newman can thank the NASCAR safety policies for that. These are policies provided by NASCAR to maximize safety for the racers, race crews, pit workers, marshals, and the fans. Where racers are concerned, there are several types of factors that govern driver safety that include car features, track features, and driver features. All of these combine to optimize driver safety. Let's consider the car features first. The vehicle currently used in NASCAR is the Generation 6 Car of Tomorrow. It is a vehicle that has been used since 2013 up until the present day. This is a vehicle that is limited to 550 horsepower. Some of the features of the Generation 6 Car of Tomorrow include a reinforced roll cage, a driver's side double frame rail with additional left-sided skin with steel plate for better resiliency in crashes, a roof that is four inches higher and two inches wider for improved roll safety, a higher traditional wicker bill type spoiler, a smaller fuel cell, 17.75 gallons or 67.2 liters to reduce the likelihood of fire. A Lexan windshield that can be readily removed for driver extrication in the event of a collision. An engine kill switch that allows drivers and safety personnel to quickly turn off the ignition after a collision. A quick release steering wheel to allow easier driver access and extrication. And energy absorption material installed between the roll cage door bars and panels to decrease energy on impact. Additional features include five or six point seatbelt harnesses that are used in conjunction with the Hans device or the Hutchins device. These keep the driver restrained in the seat and prevent driver whiplash. These are operated on a single latch release system. Vehicles also include window nets which protect the driver from flying debris and contain the driver's arms during a crash. Restrictor plates are used at some tracks in an effort to control vehicle speed. Restrictor plates are devices that are used to impede airflow into the motor to reduce engine power. However, while they reduce engine power and vehicle speed, unfortunately, restrictor plates also bunch cars together into large packs. And whenever cars are bunched together in large packs, crazy things are gonna happen. The restrictor plate, interestingly, has not been used at the Daytona track since 2019. Another feature of these cars are the roof flaps, which are designed to prevent cars from becoming airborne or flipping down the track during a collision. Spins can cause the vehicle to function aerodynamically like a wing, and at sufficient speed, this can create lift, allowing cars to become airborne. The recessed flaps open during spins due to low pressure areas above the vehicle. Flaps can eliminate most of the lift 
thereby keeping cars on the ground rather than in the air, usually. While there are no doubt many more safety features in the vehicles, these are some of the main safety features in the current generation of the car of tomorrow. However, the safety policies don't end with the features of the cars themselves. There are also track features which help to keep the drivers safe. One of the most important track features is the safer barrier. The safer barrier, which stands for steel and foam energy reduction barrier, are safety features installed on the walls around NASCAR tracks that absorb and reduce kinetic energy during the impact of high speed crashes. Energy is dissipated along longer portions of the wall than might otherwise have occurred without the barrier. Impact energy to cars and drivers is reduced and the car is generally not propelled back into the flow of traffic. Another important safety feature employed by NASCAR are spotters. NASCAR does not allow mirrors to extend outside of the vehicle. As a result, NASCAR race cars are handicapped by rather large blind spots. NASCAR uses team spotters to address this problem. Spotters are race personnel that are located at strategic locations around the track. They communicate with their drivers via two-way radio. Spotters advise the drivers on how to navigate the track and in particular, track obstructing crashes when they occur. Spotters are required whenever a car is on track. At some tracks, multiple spotters are required by the rules and regulations. They provide an essential role for drivers that allows them to remain out of trouble and to employ strategy when moving around the track at ridiculous speeds. However, not all collisions can be avoided. During a collision, there are additional features specific to the drivers that help to keep them safe. Drivers are required to wear a Nomex fire retardant suit and underwear. This provides them with protection from heat and burns in the event of a fire. They also wear fire retardant shoes and gloves. Moreover, they are required to wear certified full face helmets. The helmet protects the driver from head and facial injuries and flying debris. In addition, the helmets have anchor points for the Hans device or Hutchins device. The Hans device or the head and neck support system is a type of head restraint that reduces the likelihood of head and neck injuries, such as basilar skull fractures. The Hans device works in conjunction with the five or six belt seat belt restraint system. The Hutchins device is another type of head restraint system that controls head movement in a collision, reducing the risk of head and neck injuries. It is used less frequently than the Hans device. However, it is more comfortable than the Hans device and it offers a greater range of motion of the head and neck while racing than does the Hans device. It is the cheaper option to the Hans device and it is used more frequently with amateur racers. Given the speed and violence of the collision, it is a miracle that Ryan Newman survived this accident relatively unscathed. It remains to be seen how he will recover from his injuries and when he will return to regular racing. At this point, several days after his collision, we now know that he has been temporarily replaced as the driver of the number six Mustang and he will not be driving in the upcoming Pennzoil 400 in Las Vegas. Hopefully, he'll recover quickly and we'll see him back in the driver's seat of the number six Mustang before long. If you like this video, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho. Just a flesh wound.